When a moving body experiences a constant force in one direction and a constant velocity at right angles to the force, it moves in a parabola. The body shown here is projected from the origin with initial velocity u at an angle theta to the horizontal. It is subjected to a vertical force due to gravity, but its horizontal velocity is not affected by this and remains constant. We can resolve the components of the initial velocity into the x and y directions respectively to analyze the motion of the body. Doing this allows us to consider the vertical and horizontal motions separately. When the body is in motion, the only force acting on it is due to gravity. It therefore experiences a constant acceleration equal to the acceleration due to gravity. Knowing that when the body reaches its maximum height, the vertical component of the velocity is zero, allows us to calculate the value of the maximum height reached. The time taken to reach the maximum height can be found by using the equation v equals u plus at. The total time of flight is double the time taken to reach the maximum height. If the air resistance is ignored, the horizontal component of the initial velocity remains constant. The horizontal distance travelled equals the horizontal velocity multiplied by the time of the flight. For a given velocity, the range is found to be a maximum when the angle of projection is 45 degrees above the horizontal. In the diagram below, the body is at point B at time t after being projected from the origin. The expression for the trajectory of the body is derived here and is in the form y equals ax plus bx squared, where a and b are constants for a given velocity and angle of projection. This is the general equation of a parabola.
In the diagram, two points on the circle are separated by the angle theta. This angle can be measured in either degrees or radians. The angle in radians, subtended at the center by the two points, is defined as the distance around the circle separating the points divided by the radius of the circle. One radian is therefore the angle subtended at the center of a circle by an arc of length equal to the radius of the circle. A complete circle is 2 pi radians. One radian is therefore about 57 degrees. In the diagram, a particle moves from point A to point B around the circumference of the circle. The angle through which the particle moves is theta radians. The rate at which the particle moves is known as the angular speed of the particle and is given the symbol omega. If the direction of the particle is also stated, then we are describing the angular velocity of the particle. By convention, anticlockwise rotations are regarded as positive and clockwise rotations as negative. If the particle moves with a constant speed around the circle, it will cover equal arcs in equal times. The angular velocity of the particle is constant. The acceleration, a, of a body moving in a circle of radius r with a constant speed v is equal to v squared divided by r. This can be derived by consideration of the change in instantaneous linear velocity of the body in a small time interval. The vectors VA and VB represent the velocity at points A and B. The change in velocity from A to B is final velocity minus initial velocity is equal to VB minus VA. The force F required to maintain the circular motion is found by using Newton's second law of motion. This force is in the same direction as the acceleration it produces and acts towards the center of the circle. We can also represent the force in terms of the angular velocity of the body.
it is common for more than one force to act on a body simultaneously. When this occurs, the forces are said to be concurrent if they act at the same point, and coplanar if they lie within the same plane. Forces are vector quantities and can therefore be added by the triangle rule. Any single force can be split into two components. This is, in fact, the reverse of combining two forces into a resultant force. In this case, the single force is resolved into two other forces. It is often extremely useful to resolve a single force into two forces in order to produce components which are perpendicular to each other. In this example, the force is resolved into the two perpendicular forces, F times cosine theta and f times sine theta. When multiple forces act at a point, it is necessary to resolve each of the separate forces into a particular direction and then find the sum of all the resolved components in that direction. To find the resultant of the above four forces, we need to resolve each force into the same two directions and sum for each direction. We can then find the resultant of the two concurrent forces. Resolving in the direction OX, Total force equals 4 plus 6 cos 30 degrees minus 5 cos 70 degrees, which equals 7.486 newtons. Note that the 2 newton force is perpendicular to OX and therefore has no component in the OX direction. Resolving in the direction OY, Total force equals 2 minus 6 cos 60 degrees minus 5 cos 20 degrees, which equals minus 5.7 newtons. Note, the result is negative, indicating that it is in the downward direction. The 4 newton force has no component in the OY direction. Once all four forces have been resolved into two perpendicular components, the resultant force and direction can be determined.
It is possible for several forces to act on a particle or rigid body simultaneously. This can result in a series of calculations of resolved forces to find any overall resultant force. In examples where three forces act on a particle or body, the analysis is simpler. These three-force problems have special features which make them easier to solve. If a body is acted on by three coplanar forces and is in equilibrium, then one of two situations exists. Either the body can be acted on by concurrent forces, or the body may be in equilibrium as a result of parallel forces acting. If a body is in equilibrium under a set of three coplanar concurrent forces, the resultant force on the body must be zero. Because force is a vector quantity, the three forces acting can be represented by vectors of suitable length and direction. Here is a force diagram for a body in equilibrium under the action of three coplanar concurrent forces A, B and C. As the body is in equilibrium, the vector sum of these forces must be zero, so they can be drawn as a triangle of forces using vectors of the appropriate size and direction. Each side of the triangle represents one of the force vectors. The triangle of forces is used to analyze three-force problems where all of the vector magnitudes are known or can be determined easily. In situations where the angles between the forces are known, it may be easier to use Lamy's theorem, which is an adaptation of the sine rule, and states that if three concurrent forces are in equilibrium, each force is proportional to the sine of the angle between the other two forces. The triangle of forces is used to analyze three-force problems where all of the vector magnitudes are known or can be determined easily. In situations where the angles between the forces are known, it may be easier to use Lamy's theorem, which is an adaptation of the sine rule, and states that if three concurrent forces are in equilibrium, each force is proportional to the sine of the angle between the other two forces.
When two surfaces are in contact, forces of friction usually exist between the surfaces. If no frictional forces are said to exist when two bodies are in contact, we say that their surfaces are smooth, or that there is smooth contact between them. If frictional forces exist between the two bodies, we say that their surfaces are rough, or that there is rough contact between them. The property of friction is always between the two surfaces in contact, and does not belong to one or other of the surfaces. If the block in the diagram is subjected to a horizontal pulling force which increases from zero, it will remain stationary for a time until the force P overcomes the frictional force F between the surfaces. The block is initially at rest, with the horizontal pulling force and the frictional force along the plane of contact both being zero. As P increases from zero, so must F, and they must be equal in magnitude up to the point where the block moves. At the point where the block starts to move, we say the pulling force has overcome the limiting value of the friction between the surfaces. For two particular surfaces in rough contact, it can be shown by experiment that the limiting value is proportional to the normal reaction between the surfaces. The constant in the equation is called the coefficient of friction between the surfaces. This represents the maximum value of the frictional force. When two bodies are in contact and the friction is limiting, two forces of contact act on each body. The diagram shows the forces acting on a block. The total reaction is the resultant of the normal reaction and the frictional force. We have seen that the magnitude of the frictional force varies from zero to its limiting value as the pulling force increases to overcome the frictional force. The angle of total reaction force will therefore also increase from zero to a maximum at the limiting friction value. At this point, it is known as the angle of friction and equals the inverse tangent of the coefficient of friction. When the friction is limiting, the magnitude of the total reaction can be shown to be equal to the value of the normal reaction multiplied by the secant of the angle. The laws of friction are listed here.
When two forces act on a point or particle, we say they are concurrent. If these two forces are equal and opposite, then the particle is in equilibrium. However, if two equal and opposite forces act on a rigid body, but not at the same point, the body may tend to rotate. It is therefore not in equilibrium. It is important to distinguish between forces acting on particles, concurrent forces, and forces acting on bodies, which may or may not be concurrent. Concurrent forces cannot produce a turning effect. Non-concurrent forces are capable of causing rotation. If one or more non-concurrent forces act on a rigid body, they may cause it to rotate about an axis. The turning effect of non-concurrent forces acting on a rigid body is measured by the moment of the force about the axis. The moment of a force about an axis is the product of the magnitude of the force and the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the force to the axis. The SI unit of the moment of a force is the Newton meter. Anticlockwise moments of forces are usually taken to be positive, and clockwise moments are usually taken to be negative. If several coplanar forces act on a rigid body, the resultant moment about a point in the plane is the algebraic sum of the individual moments about that point. In the diagram, ABCD is a uniform square lamina subject to the forces shown. To find the resultant moment about a point, it is necessary to calculate the individual moments due to each of the forces. The resultant moment about point A is found to be plus 6 newton meters. As this result is positive, the lamina will rotate in the anti-clockwise direction if A is the axis of rotation. As the result in this case is positive, the lamina will rotate in the anti-clockwise direction if A is the axis of rotation. For a body in equilibrium, the resultant moment about any axis is zero. In other words, the sum of the anti-clockwise moments about any axis is equal and opposite to the sum of the clockwise moments about the same axis. A couple is formed when two equal parallel forces which are not collinear act in opposite directions. Two forces, each of magnitude f acting in opposite directions at different points on a body, form a couple. The couple has a zero resultant, as the forces are equal and opposite. The couple does have a moment, which is equal to f times d.
For a system of forces to be in equilibrium, no resultant force must act. If a resultant force acts, then the system would accelerate and would therefore not be in equilibrium. Also, no resultant turning effect must act. To determine if a system of forces is in equilibrium, any of the following three sets of criteria can be tested. For a particle to be in equilibrium under a set of coplanar concurrent forces, the sum of all the resolved forces in any direction in the system must be zero. When this occurs, there will be no resultant force and therefore no acceleration of the particle. To determine if a particle is in equilibrium or to calculate a balancing force to restore equilibrium, first draw a clear force diagram. Then choose a direction in which to resolve the forces acting on the particle. Find the resultant force in the chosen direction, remembering that forces have no resultant perpendicular to the direction. Show equilibrium by determining that the resultant force acting on the particle is zero, or determine the single resultant force acting and show the consequent balancing force required to restore equilibrium. For a rigid body to be in equilibrium under a set of coplanar forces, two conditions need to be satisfied. The sum of all the resolved forces in two perpendicular directions in the system must be zero, and the resultant moment about any point in the plane of the forces must also be zero. To find out if a rigid body under a set of coplanar forces is in equilibrium, draw a clear force diagram then, firstly, choose two perpendicular directions in which to resolve the forces acting on the rigid body. Then, find the resultant force in each of the chosen directions, remembering that forces have no resultant perpendicular to their direction. Show equilibrium by determining that the resultant force acting on the body is zero in both directions. Finally, choose a point in the plane and show that moments taken about that point produce no resultant turning effect.
A particle is said to be moving with simple harmonic motion if the acceleration of the particle is directly proportional to the distance from a fixed point and is always directed towards that point. In linear simple harmonic motion, a particle oscillates in a straight line with a linear acceleration which is proportional to the linear displacement of the particle from a fixed point and is always directed to that point. In the diagram, O is the fixed point about which the oscillation occurs and is also known as the center of oscillation or mean position. A is the amplitude of the oscillation and is the maximum distance the particle moves from O. X is the displacement of the particle at a given time, T. At O, the speed is a maximum and the acceleration is zero. At distance A from point O, the speed is zero and the acceleration is a maximum. The basic equation for simple harmonic motion can be deduced from its definition. The period of the motion is the time taken for one complete oscillation and is equal to the time taken to travel four times the amplitude. The frequency of the simple harmonic motion is the number of complete oscillations made in unit time. Any force that is directed towards a fixed point and which is proportional to the displacement from that point produces SHM. One system which satisfies this definition is the force produced by an elastic string or spring. In this case, the extension of the string or spring, which obeys Hooke's law, is directly proportional to the tension. The diagram shows that the tension in the spring increases with the extension. At position 1, the spring is unextended and the tension equals zero. At position 2, the extension is equal to L and the tension equals K times L. At position 3, the extension has increased to L plus X and the tension has increased proportionally to K times L plus X. A simple pendulum consists of a small bob of mass m suspended from a fixed point by a light inextensible string of length l. If the bob is moved through a small angle and released, it oscillates about the point O. When the bob is at point A, the forces on the bob are the tension in the string and the weight of the bob itself. Resolving the forces, there is a net restoring force acting tangentially towards O. If the angle theta is small, theta in radians is very nearly equal to the sine of theta. In such cases, the motion of the bob is simple harmonic, oscillating about point O. The time period, T, of a pendulum undergoing small oscillations is independent of the amplitude of oscillation. For a given position on the Earth, where the value of g is constant, t depends only on the length of the pendulum. 